Teenagers all over America will be rushing home looking for one thing, the thick college acceptance envelope. I never got one of those. It's been billed as the only way to get a good paying job, but what is the real value of a college education? Over the next hour, we'll dissect what it means to have that degree, how to pay for it, and what to do once you have it. We start with the cost of tuition and where to get the best value for your dollar. Joining us from Athens, Ohio, is Dr. Richard Vetter. He is director of the Center for College Affordability and Productivity. Welcome to the show, Dr. Vetter. Glad to be with you. Okay, congratulations on your Bobcats for beating Georgetown last night. You're not going to hold it against any of your students for not showing up in the class today, are you? No, they. I, today is a free day. You can do anything <laughs> you want today as, as long as our basketball team keeps winning. They were all out on Court Street last night living it up, so you'll forgive them for today, huh? <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. Okay, what about the situation with colleges now? Because it's not getting any cheaper to send your kids to college. Uh, how, do, how do, especially parents, how do they find the best value? Because I, I guarantee you, year in and year out nowadays, that's what they're looking for more than anything. Yes, and uh, the best value, of course, and the best school for a, an individual child will vary from student to student, depending on what their interests are, what field they want to go into. Uh, whether they want to go to a country club, which uh, has a lot of recreational facilities, or whether they want value in their education as the major uh, uh, component of, of, in their thinking process. Uh, uh, there are a number of, of rankings of people who have looked at best buys in higher ed. I've done this uh, on, uh, on uh, some rankings I've done for Forbes magazine and come up with a best buy list. Uh, I can you know, talk to you about that if you'd like and give you some ideas of uh, suggestions of schools that uh, tend to rank pretty highly. Please do, sir, because I mean I think that's what everybody wants to know. Is it worth it to pay for, say, Harvard? Hmm. Well, for some people, it is worth paying for Harvard. Uh, first of all, only a very select portion of the uh, people can get into Harvard, independent of the issue of cost. And for a person whose aspirations and whose talents suggest that it's someday they're going to be leaders in, a, in American corporations or in American uh, government, uh, maybe going to Harvard is a good deal. But for an awful lot of people, they should be thinking of, about some smaller schools, schools that we might think is, are rather obscure. There's a school in Kentucky called Berea College, a great buy. No tuition charges at all. The students are expected to work a little while at school. Uh, Cooper's Union in New York City is a similar private school that charges essentially no tuition. The military academies, of course, charge no tuition. There's a wonderful little college in Florida called New College that's a public school, but it acts just like a private liberal arts college and has low tuition rates. So there are some opportunities out there. Sir, can you back up to Berea College, though? I mean, I know Cooper's Union in Manhattan, that's a teaching college. Mm -hmm. You can go out, you teach. It's almost, I, I agree with you. I think that's a great deal because you're getting your experience at the same time. What do you have to do at Berea College in order to get free tuition? Yeah. Well, Berea College raised an endowment of nearly a billion dollars. It's probably gone down some in, uh, uh, since the financial crisis. But they uh, accumulated a large endowment. And rather than use it to build fancy buildings, give their faculty low teaching loads and high salaries, etc., they used it, they committed it to keeping the cost of going to college down. It's in a poor area of Appalachia, a lot of low-income students. They actually prefer low-income students. And so they have accumulated enough endowment that they can offer uh, essentially a, a, a zero-cost education. Uh, to help finance the students work for the, the college doing uh, jobs around the campus to help keep costs down uh, some. Dr. Vetter, the one big or relatively big state school you have on your list is the University of Wyoming. Now, what makes the University of Wyoming different from the University of Arizona, University of Idaho, any other state school? Well, the University of Wyoming has a relatively low tuition. I think the last time I looked, it was around $3,000, which is quite a bit lower than most other state universities. Qualitatively, it's a pretty good school. It's, uh, you know, it's not Harvard. Uh, it's not uh, uh, the very top, but it is uh, well above average for state schools. Their students uh, seem to get pretty decent jobs. They uh, are happy with the classes they take. 
graduation rates aren't too bad. These are the kinds of things I look at when I evaluate a, college, uh, a, a school. Can the kids get a job? Do they like the classes they're taking? Are they running up a big debt? Uh, things al along, uh, do they get through in four years? These are the kinds of things I look at when I rank colleges. And I think that's what parents are in and students are interested in as well. So, sir, if these schools can do it for pretty, pretty darn cheap, why then is the cost of tuition going up around the country everywhere else? Well, you have asked the $64 question. Uh, the reason costs are going up is because universities can get away with it. Uh, uh, they raise costs, uh, tuition fees and other fees, because third parties are paying a lot of the bills, much like health insurance. Someone else is paying the bill, the government or uh, student loan providers or what have you. And so that means they don't pay too much attention to costs. They're nonprofits, so they don't have a bottom line. They're not, there's no great incentives in any university that I've ever worked with, and I've been teaching for 45 years, by the way. There are no incentives to keep costs down, or at least no important incentives to keep costs down. So we tend to let costs rise. And uh, uh, we don't use innovation. We don't use technology the way we should to cut costs, out like, unlike the for-profit providers of higher ed who are much more uh, uh, conscious of cost and they work uh, assiduously but, to keep them but down. But some of the things you suggested were tuition caps and restricting tenure. I mean, I'm all about that. Uh, uh, would that solve the problem? Well, uh, I think tenure is, a, is an issue that needs to be addressed. I don't think abolishing tenure will solve any huge problems. I guess uh, as far as taxing tuition, in the short run, all that would do is raise the cost of college as opposed to lowering it. Uh, but it is the reason I've suggested that maybe we should, maybe we should stop subsidizing universities because the main benefit of universities go to the students. They don't go to the public at large. They go to the students, and that's uh, why I've mentioned that. But, but, but we need to put more market incentives into the higher education process. We sure do. Doctor, thanks so much for being with us today. Glad to be with you. Dr. Richard Vetter, director of the Center for College Affordability and Productivity. We could use more of that. <laughs>